It is a great honor and privilege to be with you this morning to bring the word of the Lord. And we're going to, of course, continue our study of the book of Acts. We're going to look at Acts 22, starting in verse 22 through chapter 23, verse 11. So we'll be looking at two different chapters today, and that can be found as well on page 1,108 in the few Bibles in front of you. So let's turn to Acts chapter 22 together. And if you're able to, let's stand for the reading of God's word. So in Acts 22, starting in verse 22, our writer Luke says this, Up to this word they listened to him. Then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he should not be allowed to live. And as they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust into the air, the tribune ordered him to be brought into the barracks, saying that he should be examined by flogging, to find out why they were shouting against him like this. But when they had stretched him out for the whips, Paul said to the centurion who was standing by, Is it lawful for you to flog a man who is a Roman citizen and uncondemned? When the centurion heard this, he went to the tribune and said to him, What are you about to do? For this man is a Roman citizen. So the tribune came and said to him, Tell me, are you a Roman citizen? And he said, yes. The tribune answered, I bought this citizenship for a large sum. Paul said, but I am a citizen by birth. So those who were about to examine him withdrew from him immediately. And the tribune also was afraid, for he realized that Paul was a Roman citizen and that he had bound him. But on the next day, desiring to know the real reason why he was being accused by the Jews, he unbound him and commanded the chief priests and all the council to meet And he brought Paul down and set him before them. And looking intently at the council, Paul said, Brothers, I have lived my life before God in all good conscience up to this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Are you sitting to judge me according to the law? And yet yet contrary to the law, you order me to be struck. Those who stood by said, Would you revile God's high priest? And Paul said, I did not know, brothers, that he was the high priest, for it is written, You shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. Now when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Brothers, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. It is with respect to the hope and the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial. And when he had said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, nor angel, nor spirit. But the Pharisees acknowledged them all. Then a great clamor arose, and some of the scribes of the Pharisees' party stood up and contended sharply, We find nothing wrong in this man. What if a spirit or an angel spoke to him? And when the dissension became violent, The tribune, afraid that Paul would be torn to pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him away from them by force and bring him into the barracks. The following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. And now let us pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your great love for us and for the love that exists between every true believer in Christ. We praise you because you have united our hearts together to lift up the name of Christ, our Savior. Fill us with your compassion for the lost, your mercy toward those in need, and your patience for those who sin against us. May we see Jesus Christ as precious each day, the one who loved us and gave himself for us. May you open doors for the spread of the gospel in this community. Open our eyes to see the needs that are all around us and how we can reach out to those who need the truth of the gospel we have come to know. May we never be ashamed of the good news about Jesus, which is the power of God unto salvation. Make us bold witnesses for Christ, that we might share the love with with which you have loved us. Open blind eyes to see the beauty of Christ and his incomparable worth and value. Remind us that we are in the midst of spiritual warfare. You have told us in your word that, 
For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Protect this congregation from the attacks of Satan. Lead us into all truth, as your word is preached this morning, and anoint us with your Holy Spirit's power. As we look at the life of the Apostle Paul this morning, may you give to us his boldness to declare the message of Jesus. And we ask for these things by the authority of his name. Amen. Amen. And you may be seated. The Apostle Paul lived a very difficult life. It seemed like he was always being persecuted and attacked for his faith in Jesus and for the testimony that he bore about how Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus. Paul's testimony for Jesus was very powerful. And last Sunday, we looked at Paul's speech to the crowd that earlier had wanted to kill him. And Paul told them in the message about how Jesus appeared to him and how he commissioned him to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. And so Jesus was with Paul in his suffering. Jesus never abandoned Paul. He was with Paul every step of the way. And so likewise, for you and for me, Jesus Christ is with us, and he is for us. Jesus Christ is with every believer, and he will be there for him or her. And so Jesus is with us as he was with Paul as we testify to the work of God and his grace in our lives. And in our passage for this morning, we're going to see how Jesus protected Paul from the Sanhedrin and from the, the Roman guards who were going to whip him. And so let's begin by looking at verse 22, which says this. Up to this word, they listened to him. Then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he should not be allowed to live. And so the word that Paul just spoke that offended them greatly was the word that Paul said about Jesus, that Jesus commissioned him to take the gospel to the Gentiles. And this infuriated the, the Jewish crowd because these Jewish people believed that in order for Gentiles to be saved, the Gentiles would have to become Jews first. These Gentiles would have to become circumcised and observe all the laws of Moses to be considered Jews and so be saved by their obedience to the Jewish law. And so there were some people who professed faith in Christ, who claimed to be Christians, but still held on to this, this remnant of Pharisaic Judaism. These were called the Judaizers. And the Judaizers were false teachers, and Paul, that's the reason why Paul wrote his letter of Galatians. Paul wrote the book of Galatians to the churches in Galatia to warn them about false teachers who were trying to mix Christianity with Pharisaical or legalistic Judaism. And that was a, a false religion. It was a different gospel. And so Paul's message that Gentiles could be saved by faith in Jesus as Gentiles without becoming Jews first is what really made them mad and said that Paul should not be allowed to live. And so because of this a disturbance of the crowd, uh, the Roman army officer, who's called the Tribune, brings Paul back into the barracks. It's unlikely that the Tribune was able to understand what Paul was saying because Paul was speaking to the crowd in Aramaic, and he probably didn't know Aramaic himself, but only Greek. So he doesn't understand the reason why the crowd is so upset with Paul. So he decides to have Paul flogged in order to get the truth out of him, to use torture to get him into confessing some crime or to, to find out the real reason behind why they are so angry with him. And so being flogged here is describing uh, the punishment known as scourging, and a scourge was a whip that had pieces of metal attached to the ends of it. This was not a normal whip, but it was a whip that was designed to tear the flesh off your back. And many prisoners would bleed to death uh, after being tortured in this way. This was the same way that Jesus was whipped before he was crucified, with a scourge with pieces of metal embedded into it. And it was against the law to use such a device against Roman citizens or to kill Roman citizens by crucifixion. And that's why the Apostle Paul was beheaded in Rome, but Peter, who was not a Roman citizen, was crucified, according to the witness of the church father, Tertullian. And so Paul wisely brings up his Roman citizenship in order to prevent himself from being flogged in this way. It is not lawful for you to flog a Roman citizen. 
And so Paul's claim that he was a Roman citizen would not need to be proved because if you claim to be a Roman citizen and were lying about it, the punishment was death. You deserve to be killed by, under Roman law if you claim to be a Roman citizen when you are not. And so the, the Roman tri uh, tribune or officer, he also could have written a letter to the city of Tarsus to ask them if Paul was a Roman citizen. And they would have kept records of all the Roman citizens who were born in their town. Roman citizens as well would also have a birth certificate, which was a piece of wood that had wax on it with a seal that signified you being a true Roman citizen. And normally, Roman citizens wouldn't carry this around with them. And if Paul did, it's possible he may have lost it in a shipwreck or it may have been stolen from him. We don't know if Paul had his birth certificate with him. But Paul was not afraid to appeal to his Roman citizenship when he was in danger. Paul appealed to his Roman citizenship, and he was not ashamed to be a Roman citizen. And Paul knew that ultimately his citizenship was not on earth, but in heaven. As Christians, our citizenship ultimately is in heaven. We are citizens of heaven. We are saved and belong to the family of God. And so even though we are citizens of the earth, that's not our identity. Our ultimate identity is not in whatever nation we belong to, but in Jesus Christ, who has saved us. And so in Romans 13, it talks about the purpose of the government. Paul writes in Romans 13 that the government is called to punish those who do evil and to protect those who are innocent. And here Paul has done no evil. He has done nothing deserving of being flogged in this way. And so he appeals to the law, and so that is very wise for him to do. And so one of the purposes of the law is to restrain tyranny, to keep the government in check, and to prevent the government from abusing its citizens. The law is supposed to restrain the government. And so I, I like what Pastor Tony Morita said about this passage. He said in his commentary on Acts that there's a difference between humbly suffering for Christ and being a victim of injustice. There's a difference between uh, hum suffering humbly for Christ and being persecuted versus being a victim of injustice. And so if the laws of our land protect us from injustice, we should appeal to the laws of our land because God created the law to protect those who are innocent. The law should protect us when we are innocent and do what is good. And the government is, is supposed to punish those who are guilty. But Paul was not guilty. He was innocent and didn't deserve to be beaten this way. And I think that our nation today is losing its sense of justice. Indeed, in our nation today, we live in a country where millions of unborn children have been killed by abortion. And this is an abomination in God's sight, the shedding of innocent blood. Our nation is calling evil good and good evil, and it's losing its sense of right and wrong because it has turned its back on God and his law, which reveals to us the truth about how we are called to live and who God is. And so the Roman tribune, because he can't get any answers, because he can't flog Paul, he appeals to the Jewish leaders to find out what's going on here. And he has to find out what's going on because he doesn't want a riot like this to happen again. He needs to get to the bottom of why they are so opposed to Paul. So he calls together a council of Jews called the Sanhedrin. And the Sanhedrin was the ruling and governing body of the Jewish people. It was made up of around 70 Jewish leaders, and most of these religious leaders would have been Pharisees. And there would have been Sadducees as well, who were the ruling minority party. So the high priest, Ananias, was a Sadducee. And the Sadducees also controlled the temple and the animal sacrifices. So the Sadducees, even though they were, were a minority, held great power over the land of Israel. And so this body of Jewish leaders, called the Sanhedrin, this was the very same Jewish leaders that Paul had appeared before many years earlier when he was known as Saul. It was the Sanhedrin who gave Paul the letters and permission to arrest Christians and bring them bound back to Jerusalem. And it was then that Paul was traveling to Damascus to arrest the Christians there and bring them back to Jerusalem for punishment. It was also before the Sanhedrin that the martyr Stephen had appeared many years before. And Stephen was stoned to death by the Sanhedrin in Acts chapter 7. And Paul was there when he was put to death. And so Paul begins his speech to the, this 
group of Jewish leaders by saying that he has a clear conscience. He says that, that brothers, I have lived my life before God in all good conscience up to this day. Paul had a, a good conscience or a clean conscience because he tried to live his life before God in faith. Paul always tried to do the will of God. He lived by faith. He was a man of integrity and character, and his conscience was clean. He didn't believe that he was guilty of, of any crime before God or before them. He was simply doing what God wanted him to do by telling people about Jesus and what Jesus did for him. And so the value of a good conscience cannot be measured. A good conscience gives to us peace and rest and inner security, freedom from, from worry and anxiety and courage. But a guilty conscience brings with it guilt, shame, and fear. That is what sin does to us. Sin brings guilt. When we do something that is wrong or sinful, we feel guilty for what we've done until we re repent of that and ask God for forgiveness. Sin brings also fear, because when we break a law, we fear punishment from the authorities or from God himself, or we may, may fear God's fatherly displeasure or discipline of us. And sin brings shame as well. So shame is the feeling of alienation and the feeling of, of wrong. It's, it's more of societal wrong. It's societal shame for doing that which is out of step with society and, and the laws of God. But a good conscience and seeking to live a life uh, of faith before God brings peace, rest, and courage. And so there's a saying of Matthew Henry that I like, and he said that a good conscience brings good courage. From a good conscience comes good courage. And we can be courageous when we have a good or clean conscience. But when we have a guilty conscience, it's, it's hard to be courageous for Christ then. Because our guilt over unconfessed and unrepented of sin hinders our witness for Christ. When we feel guilty and ashamed and fearful, it's hard to serve Jesus then. It's hard to witness for Christ when we are still holding on to our sins. It's hard to be an effective witness for Jesus when we are sinning. But Paul had the character of an honest man. He was a man of integrity, and because he had a good conscience, he could serve God freely and without shame and tell other people about Jesus and how Jesus had radically transformed his life. His conscience was clear before God, and therefore he could be an effective servant for Jesus. But his opponents, though, were not honest men. His opponents were not men of character and integrity, as we're going to see right after this. And so in response to Paul's statement that he has a clear conscience before God, the high priest Ananias orders him to be struck on the mouth. And so a, a, a guard who is there hits Paul and strikes him. Now Ananias served as the Jewish high priest from around 48 to 58 A.D. He was a very powerful leader in Israel, but he wasn't liked very much by many Jews because Ananias was very much pro-Roman in his politics. He, he favored policies that, that favored the Romans and their occupation of Israel rather than the Jewish people. And he did this because he wanted the protection and favor of the Gentiles and of the Roman army. And so uh, Paul goes on to say this about Ananias. He says to him that God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. And so when Paul said this, that God is going to strike you, he was actually giving a prophecy. He is prophesying the future because this is exactly what happened to Ananias. Many years later, in 66 AD, the Jewish historian Josephus writes about the death of Ananias. He says that Ananias was assassinated by Jewish rebels in 66 AD during the revolt against Rome because he was on the side of Rome and was seen as an enemy. So Jewish assassins put him to death. And so God did, in fact, strike Ananias dead. The Lord gave him time to repent, but apparently he, he never repented of his sins and placed his faith in Jesus for salvation. It's the, and it's also the, the same for people today. God gives to everyone time to repent. God is patient, and God wants people to believe in Jesus and be saved and to repent of their sins. But sadly, there's so many people in our world who don't do that. They don't redeem the time. They, they don't trust in Jesus while they have the opportunity. 
to do so. And so Paul's words teach us that unjust rulers like Ananias will face God's judgment one day for their sins. And Paul calls him a, a whitewashed wall or a wall that is painted white. And so, so what does this metaphor or word picture mean? Well, it's, it's a picture of hypocrisy. Ananias was like a, a wall that was white but was very unstable. He looked clean and good on the outside, and he likely would have been wearing his high priestly attire. He would have been wearing his fine priestly clothing, but yet on the inside he was corrupt. And in fact, Jesus said the very same thing to the Jewish leaders of his day. Jesus said this in Matthew 23, 27. He said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. And so Ananias was a whitewashed wall or tomb who had an attractive outside, but inside he was filled with that which was unclean. And so Paul as well, when he says this, he's also echoing the words of the prophet Ezekiel. Because before Jesus talked about whitewashed tombed, tombs, Ezekiel talked about whitewashed walls. So Ezekiel, the Old Testament prophet, said this about the false prophets of his day. In Ezekiel 13, 10 through 11, he says, Precisely because they have misled my people, saying, Peace when there is no peace. And because when the people build a wall, these prophets smear it with whitewash. Say to those who smear it with whitewash that it shall fall. So Ananias looked like a, a wall that was painted white. He looked stable, but in reality he was unstable. He was like a wall that looked pretty, but was about to fall over. And so his outward appearance was deceiving. And so we have to ask that same question of ourselves. Are we whitewashed walls or tombs? Are we hypocrites? Are we deceiving other people? Are we really who we claim to be? Are we really, truly born-again Christians? Or are we leading people astray? So that's a call for self-examination. Am I a hypocrite? Am I self-deceived and deceiving others? And so this is a call to repent, to repent of whatever hypocrisy that we have in our hearts, because God knows the truth about us. God sees our heart. Other people may only see what's on the outside, but God knows what is really on the inside of us. And so when Paul, rebukes, when Paul is rebuked uh, for prophesying judgment against Ananias, he responds by saying, I did not know, brothers, that he was the high priest, for it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. I think here when Paul says this, I think he knows that Ananias is the high priest, but he's speaking sarcastically or he's speaking ironically because a true high priest would never give such an order in violation of God's law. Paul did not see anything holy or priestly in this man because the priest of God were called to be holy men and Ananias was no true priest of God. In Leviticus chapter 19, verse 15, it says this about the law and, and Jewish courts. Leviticus says that you shall do no injustice in court. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great, but in righteousness you shall judge your neighbor. Ananias failed to do this. He showed injustice toward Paul and showed that he was no true priest of God. He may have been a, tree, a priest of Israel, but he was not God's priest. And so the Jewish law said that someone who was accused of a crime was innocent until proven guilty. Uh, you had to be proved guilty in a court of law before you were treated like a criminal. And so it's the same in our nation today. You are supposed to be innocent until proven guilty in the court of law. And so I'm very thankful that as an American, we have laws that protect those who are innocent. If you commit a crime, you are innocent until, you, until proven guilty. Or if you are accused of a crime, there's the presumption of innocent until, until you are proven to be guilty with on, with, beyond a shadow of a doubt. And so, as I said earlier, I think our nation is losing its sense of justice or righteousness. Our, our nation, at least for now, has a semblance of righteousness. And so I'm thankful for the, the laws that we have as of right now. Though that may change in the future. And so the way that Paul was treated by Ananias and the Jewish leaders here revealed to him that he's not going to get a fair trial. They're not going to treat him fairly, just as they didn't treat Stephen fairly 
in Acts chapter 7 before he was stoned by them. And so what Paul does is very ingenious. He divides his accusers against each other. He pits them against each other by bringing up the topic of the resurrection of the dead. He says, brothers, I am a Pharisee, the son of of Pharisees, and I am here because of my hope in the resurrection of the dead. And so on this point, Paul is in agreement with the Pharisees. And so most of the Jewish leaders there were Pharisees, and the minority, the ruling party, were Sadducees. And the Sadducees were the theological liberals of the day. And so the Sadducees claimed to believe in the Torah, or the law of God, There's debate about whether they viewed the whole Old Testament canon as scripture or whether only the first five books of the Bible. That's a a debatable point. I think that the Sadducees did, in fact, believe in all the Old Testament scriptures, not just the first five books. But they were liberals. They didn't believe the contents of the books. So they didn't believe in the future resurrection. Uh, They didn't believe in the existence of angels, uh, even though the first five books of the Bible are filled with references to angels. And they didn't believe in the existence of spirits. Now, there's a joke about the Sadducees that helps us remember what they believed in, and it goes like this. The Sadducees were called Sadducees because they didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead, and that's why they were so sad, you see. They were sad, you see, or Sadducees because they had no future hope. They were sad and lived a miserable life, believing that this life is all that there is. They had no hope for life after death. Now, uh, people who study the book of Acts are are divided about what Luke means here when he says that they didn't believe in the existence of spirit. They didn't believe in the existence of the resurrection nor of angel or of spirit. Now, the word spirit here in verse 8, this could be a reference to demonic spirits. So that's a possible interpretation, and it may be right. So spirits could be demons. So the Bible says that demons are fallen angels who have rebelled against God, and they've they've sinned against God and have fallen from heaven. And and these demons are sometimes referred to as unclean spirits in the Gospels. They are unclean spirits that seek to tempt others, and they they afflict people, and and they possess people who don't believe in Jesus. In fact, we we see the same term used in verse 9. In the very next verse, the Pharisees say this. What if a spirit or an angel spoke to him? Referring to the two things that the Sadducees don't believe in, spirits and angels. But I don't think it would make much sense here to try to defend Paul by saying that a demon may have spoken to Paul. Uh, Demons, after all, are not very reliable sources. And so if they're going to defend Paul, I don't see why they would mention that a demon may have spoken to him. I think instead that the word spirit here refers to the human soul or spirit that is separated from the body at death. And one reason I think this is because of what the historian Josephus said about the beliefs of the Sadducees. Uh, Josephus wrote about the four main Jewish groups at this time. Uh, Josephus talks about the Pharisees and their observance of the law, and the, also, they also had the Jewish oral law, which is, which is later on called the Mishnah. He talks about the Sadducees and their beliefs, and he also talked about the Essenes. The Essenes were the people who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls that you may have heard about. The Essenes were people who lived in the wilderness by themselves, and they were separated from Israel because they viewed all the other Jews as being unclean. And they were the people who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls and copied many of the Jewish scriptures that, that we have today that were discovered in the Judean desert. And the fourth group are the Zealots, who were the people who wanted to start a revolution against Rome. And so so Josephus says this about the Sadducees. He said, But the doctrine of the Sadducees is this, that souls die with the bodies. They believe that the soul dies with the body. So because they don't believe in the resurrection, and because they believe the soul dies with the body, they didn't believe in any future existence after death. You die and your, your, your soul dies with you and you're not raised from the dead. I think that helps explain why they were lovers of money. They loved money because they believed this life was all that there is. And so I think the, the term soul here that Josephus uses is, is the, being used the same way as the word spirit is being used in the book of Acts. In fact, in uh, Revelation chapter 6, verse 9, it talks about the souls of those 
who have been beheaded for their witness for Jesus. The souls of, of dead believers who are in heaven uh, praising God and, and asking God in Revelation 6, how long, O Lord, until you avenge our blood? And, and there's one place in the Bible where the souls of departed saints are referred to as spirits. And that, that's in the book of Hebrews. In Hebrews 12, 23, the author of Hebrews says this, And to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. So heaven is the home of spirits of the righteous made perfect. And I think the word spirits there in Hebrews 12, 23, that, that can't refer to angels because angels have always been perfect. Angels are without sin, but if these spirits have been made perfect, that implies that they always haven't been perfect. And so you and I are, are sinners apart from God's grace. We are not perfect right now. We still sin. But one day when we die and go to be with Jesus, or if Jesus comes back before then, we will, we will be made perfect. We will be glorified and made like Jesus forever, and we will never sin again. And so these Pharisees, who earlier wanted to kill Paul, now rise to his defense. And they say that it's possible that an angel or a spirit, or I think you're a departed saint, may have spoken to him. And so what they're saying here is that maybe something really did happen on the road to Damascus. Maybe Paul isn't lying. Maybe an angel appeared to him or a spirit, and Paul simply misunderstood the vision that was given to him. Of course, the Pharisees didn't believe that it was Jesus who spoke to him on the road to Damascus because they believed that Jesus was a false Messiah and he wasn't raised from the dead. But maybe an angel spoke to him or, or some other uh, spirit, and Paul simply misunderstood the vision. And so Paul's conversion to Christianity is all just some big misunderstanding on Paul's behalf. And so maybe if we're able to get Paul out of here, we can convince Paul that he simply misunderstood the vision and that it wasn't really Jesus who spoke to him. And so uh, they defend Paul by saying that we find nothing wrong with this man. And so what do those words remind you of? We find nothing wrong with this man. Those were the very same words that Pilate said about Jesus. Pilate said, I find no basis for a charge against this man. Jesus Christ never sinned once. He was innocent of these charges. And so likewise, Paul, though he, he was a sinner saved by grace, Paul was innocent of these charges. And so God turns Paul's enemies against each other, and so his life is spared. And so Paul is not going to suffer the same fate as Stephen did many years ago at the hands of the Jewish leaders. So being a Roman citizen saved Paul from being flogged, and being a Pharisee in the sense that he believed in the resurrection saved him from being stoned by the Sanhedrin. And so throughout the book of Acts, Paul's message divides people. People are divided by Paul's gospel. And in fact, that's what the gospel does. The gospel divides people. The gospel divides all people into one of two groups, those who believe in Jesus and are saved, and those who don't believe, believe in Jesus yet and are lost. And so we have to ask ourselves, what, which two group am I a part of? Do I believe Paul and his message, or do I not believe in Jesus really and truly? And so the gospel not only divides, but the gospel also unites. The gospel unites all believers together around our common Savior, Jesus, who is the very Son of God. And so Paul's hope here is in the resurrection of his hope is in the resurrection of Jesus because Jesus' resurrection secures our future resurrection from the dead. Because Jesus lives, we shall live with him one day. Even though we may die, God is going to raise us bodily from the dead. And so there is no Christianity without the resurrection. Paul said in 1 Corinthians fifteen fourteen, And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. A Savior who is dead cannot save us from death. And now Jesus Christ is alive, and he is interceding for us before the Father. John says in 1 John 2, 1, that we have a mediator with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Jesus Christ intercedes for us and mediates for us before his Father in heaven. And so we don't need to fear condemnation for our sins, because Christ is a great Savior of sinners. And I think as well, that Paul brings up the resurrection to show the Roman, Romans who were guarding him that he was not in rebellion against Rome. Rather, this was a theological disagreement with the Jewish leaders. 
This is a debate over, over theology and not one about Rome. And so Rome has nothing to fear from Paul. And then the following night, Paul receives a vision and a message from Jesus. It says in verse 11 that the Lord stood by him and said, Take courage, for as you have testified to the facts of me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. Jesus had not forgotten about Paul. Paul perhaps may have felt as if Jesus had forgotten about him, but he never did. Jesus was with Paul every step of the way. Jesus was with Paul, and he was for Paul. He was there with Paul in that prison cell in the fortress. And so likewise, Jesus has not forgotten about you either. He will never, ever leave you or forsake you. He, he is with you, and he is for you. Jesus is God with us. That's what the name Emmanuel means. He is God present with us. He is God in the flesh. He is present with us now by his Holy Spirit who is in our hearts. And where two or three are gathered in his name, he is there in power with them. And so Jesus tells Paul that you have testified about me in Jerusalem. In other words, you did your job. Well done, good and faithful servant. You did what I asked you to do. You truly testified about me in Jerusalem. And now you're going to testify about me in Rome. And so here we see a promise from Jesus to Paul. He's telling him that you are going to, be, to journey to Rome. I am not going to allow you to die before you get to Rome. And so later on in chapter 27, Paul is going to be shipwrecked. And so Paul knows that he's not going to die in the shipwreck because otherwise that would, that would make Jesus into a liar. But Jesus as, as God can't lie. And so that means that, Paul, that no matter what happens to him, he can't die until he reaches Rome. And so he is immortal until then. And so this promise to him by Jesus gives to him the encouragement that he needs to carry on. Paul needed God's grace, and that is what he received. He needed encouragement, and he, he needed a, a, a sign from God that he was doing God's will. And that is exactly what God gave to him. And so God gives to us grace and hope in our time of need. Jesus may not speak to us in a vision as he did to Paul, but God has given to us his Holy Spirit who comforts us. He has given to us his written word, the Bible, that is filled with God's promises to us in our times of need. So that's why we need to read the Bible. We need to read the Bible to be reminded of God's promises to us because every one of them will come to pass one day. And Jesus stands with us in our suffering. He has given to us his Holy Spirit. And if God is for us, who can be against us? If God is with us, then there's no power on earth that can oppose us. And he will bring us safely home. And we cannot lose. I like the saying of one Christian writer. I'm not sure who wrote this saying, but it's very good. This Christian writer said, God has not guaranteed an easy voyage, but he has promised a safe harbor. Indeed, the voyage is not easy, but the harbor will be safe. Heaven is a place of perfect safety and security for the saints of God. Though in this life we are tempted and tried all of our days, we know that one day we shall be with Jesus forever. That will be our safe harbor. The voyage will be very difficult, but in the end we will make it there. Our ship will arrive in heaven because God will preserve and protect his people until that day. And so until we go to be with Jesus, he is with us. So do not lose heart. Take courage because the Lord is with you and he will see you safely home. And let us pray together. Our Father, we thank you for your promises to us that you will see us safely home. And so we look forward to that day of heaven. And until then, Lord, we pray that you would help us to be faithful, help us to be courageous, that we would be the kind of Christians that you want us to be, following Jesus Christ, who is your one and only Son. And we pray this in his name. Amen. And our closing benediction is from Romans 8, 35-39, where Paul says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, For your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us.
For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And you are dismissed in his peace.